So welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to give a little brief presentation of uh, who we are in the case you are uh, uh, new uh, in this channel. Um, well, we are uh, the Design Futures Initiative. We are the local chapter of Madrid. We are a non-profit organization based in San Francisco. Uh, and just we want to uh, generate an active uh, futures thinking community here in Madrid. So uh, the initiative was founded in, in San Francisco by designers and for designers. Uh, but nowadays we are designers, futurists, uh, researchers, architects, science fiction writers, all profiles <laughs> you can imagine. Um, we are nowadays more than 40 chapters worldwide and well, uh, these uh, chapters are increasing each month and it's amazing. Um, we also organize two events uh, worldwide, well, wor worldwide, two big events, one in the United States and one in Europe. We have organized the last one in Europe in Madrid and it was wonderful to, to have this um, brightful minds in Madrid and to know uh, what futurists uh, from Europe and from America here in Madrid. Um, this is our uh, team in Madrid, Ruben, Milla, Lourdes and Steph, who is the one who uh, joined the last to the, to the team, in the case you didn't uh, came to the last uh, event because she present the last, the last one. Say hi. <laughs> And um, well, this is, this is our, our um, social networks. We, uh, we have Twitter, we have Instagram, and we have also uh, the global uh, community in Slack. So in the case you want to join, uh, we are going to share an invitation through, through the chat, okay? And we have also changed our email in the case you, you want to contact us for whatever the reason, if you want to, to share with us a project and we consider it very interesting to, to have an event uh, to, to show the project, we will consider it. Um, well, thank you all for joining. I'm going to present um, Tomas. Just, uh, I want to stop uh, and give you the the control, Thomas of Zoom. Well, Thomas is uh, an architect and a an strategist. Uh, he has worked uh, in several innovation uh, projects, designs and strategies for EDF Energy, IKEA Research Lab, Space 10, and the Strelka Institute, Institute uh, for Media, Architecture and Design. Um, he operates globally through the platform Raft. We are going to share also the links through the chat. And he combines hard facts and cultural strategies to create speculative models for the present. So, Thomas, we really want to uh, uh, know how you do that. And I give you the word and the controls of the Zoom, so you can start when you want. Thank you, Andrea. Can everybody see me now? And listen to me, maybe? Yeah, we can. Everybody is here. You. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen, I guess, uh, first of all. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a lot of bookings. I never have so many bookings only for myself. I was in big events, but it was always with other people. I was kind of uh, super excited about it. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen so we can go inside the presentation. And I hope uh, you like it. So we're in Speculative Features Madrid. And the presentation is called Speculative Models for the Present. And actually, the structure of the presentation is particularly going to talk about the past. I think that those three elements, uh, sorry, I'm going to go full screen, those three elements work together. Uh, no. Can you see the whole screen now? So those three elements work together. So it's going to be a genealogy of my past experience, but not focusing on the experience at all, but focusing on the mindsets, the mindsets that I've been going through and that normally has been linked either to discipline, to places, or to a specific projects. So hopefully, if you understand this process and this evolution, you are going to be able to understand better my position today and what the speculative models for the, pre for the present means for me. 
So here we go. First of all, I'm an architect. Uh, I started in Barcelona, in Spain. I finished my studies in 2011. I have to, I have a love-hate relationship with my background, but I have to make some uh, things that I have to recognize that I have learned from it, and some of the things that probably uh, have stopped me from from perceiving the world otherwise. But I, from architecture, I have to say that obviously it's a very very, very well-established discipline. It has projective models in its core nature, uh, and there is a clear and expected output. It's established discipline with its own language with its own means for representation and with its own means for implementation, no? It teaches me abstract, abstract thought and diagrammatic representation in a, in a culture of critique, which is not always a critique of the culture. But on the other hand, it's probably one of the slowly changing disciplines in design, precisely for the scale at which it operates. So when I finished my studies in architecture almost 10 years ago, uh, I had the feeling that a digital world has been built in the meantime and that I was not ready to understand it. I had learned an analog discipline. And I didn't have to, the tools to really understand the world I was living. That was not so important. I end my studies. Uh, I finished everything in 2011 when crisis was hitting Spain in the worst moments. So there was not really a lot of chances to, to work in Spain as an architect. So let's say that this genealogy goes from crisis to crisis. Uh, but I was lucky. I got a really, really interesting uh, job in Switzerland. Uh, it sounds really cool. I, will, I worked for two years in one of the biggest renovation projects in Europe is the renovated, the United, energetic renovation of the United Nations Palace. This made me develop some kind of uh, uh, super high relation to management. Uh, I was uh, going out of school with this idea of developing creative projects, you know, uh, projective models. And I went to a world where everything was about a descriptive model Everything was about data collection. Everything was about data classification, taxonomy, structure, analysis, and basically gener generating a descriptive model of the building that we can replicate and empty the future of any risk so nothing gets changed in this building. Uh, it was also one of the more securitized environments on Earth. Like while we were working on this building, Obama was probably uh, giving a presentation in the United Nations. We have 100 workers that were working there while the building was fully percent operative, everyone had to be tracked at any point. So every movement, every piece that they were putting in a window, whatever, everything has to be somehow registered, planified, and notified to the administration of the UN. Uh, it was a traumatic experience to me. It made me understand the value of productivity, the usefulness of uh, management, but also was one of the most alienating for a personal point of view. Finally, after those two years of management, um, I got a small recognition and the company I was working for gave me a team of architects to develop architectural competitions in the Swiss context. I developed one university, sorry, universities, uh, a world for the a building for the World Council of Churches, housing, small scale, large scale, even commercial buildings. But what happened? It was not only designing windows. It was not only designing uh, projects. It was defining and perfecting a methodology to develop competition uh, projects in a very specific context, the Swiss context. I was actually, as a Spanish architect, acting as a cultural translator between uh, a Swiss company, a Swiss client, a Swiss context, and a number of international architects from all around the world. Uh, in other projects, you can see some similar traits. I would say compactness, pure shapes, reg regular grids, conservative material combinations, calm diagrammatic style, consistent line weights, integrated vegetation, yeah. We were using design and we were making explicit decisions, but those explicit decisions were somehow ideologically charged to reinforce this, the already existing status quo of the local culture. So working in this context gave me a very, very, very uh, first-hand experience of the things that I was more conscious and more, worries, more worried about in life. And I understood actually making, maybe making buildings was not necessarily the thing I wanted to do or not the only thing I wanted to do. Actually, I thought at that time that my, my previous conception of design was somehow limiting. And that in fact, it was systems and culture, the real matters of concern of the design practice that I wanted to develop. So in order to understand those, I somehow need to develop new tools, new models, and new languages. And I found the post-it and everything was solved. No, it's a joke. But at that time, everything that was dealing with those matters was related to, to, to post-its. 
I somehow for some aesthetic reason could never uh, identify with the methodologies and with the trust in the processes. In the end, I ended up studying innovation management in Central St. Martins. Central St. Martins is an art school and probably known for fashion better, probably the most famous fashion school in the world. And I studied a business program of this art school. What does that mean? Uh, it means that it was a discipline in the make, all the opposite than architecture. There was not a clear output, and there was many windows open, but not any defined path. And it was, everything was about self-direction. And we were basically uh, using the theories from the world of art to analyze the world of business. So looking to the business discourse from an art and theory perspective. We were uh, exposed to corporate social responsibility, design thinking, service design, circular design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but also organizational theory, cultural studies, semiotics, semiotics discourse analysis and speculative design, if you want to put it that way. It was my introduction to many different disciplines within those, then later I make my path. Uh, my final master's thesis on that uh, environment uh, was called the critical firm. It was looking at corporate political action, at corporate identity and at corporate social responsibility from the perspective of cultural studies and cultural branding. It was uh, developed in a very specific context, which is uh, network society, pre-Brexit UK and 2016 uh, Trump presidential campaign, when a lot of companies all over the globe were making like a lot of uh, communication campaigns with some certain kind of activism that obviously in the next years has become like the norm. Uh, so my point in that moment was that uh, on going deep systemic trust crisis in Western societies, we could understand the race of populism and of populist politics as a failure of the corporate world to engage extensive sectors of the population. And considering that corporate social responsibility, which is a very, very necessary practice, but a very, very, very mild identity, uh, had failed somehow as an identity to engage those sectors of the population. I was mostly uh, calling that uh, the mobilization of the corporate world against Donald Trump actually legitimized him as, a, as an independent, as an outsider within the system. No? And that in fact, populism was doing many things wrong, but they were understanding certain aspects of culture uh, better than the establishment. So to reinstate, to reinstate trust among those sectors, the corporate world actually should need to perform a parallelism that offers symbolic resolution to the ongoing societal tension. So we could not solve everything when one single mild uh, hegemonic identity, but a diversity of uh, corporate political identities should be at play. Should be at play. Uh, with this framework in mind, I, I consider that was the allocation of an opportunity and I develop a strategy for one specific identity to maybe develop some uh, fruitful strategies. Uh, what I call the critical frame was mostly proposing that the purposeful generation of conflict, of political conflict within the business world uh, could generate legitimacy for certain sectors of the population uh, among business. So somehow I was coming to say that certain business should target the political activity of other business and gain legitimacy among citizens through that. I, will, I, I don't think that I have to go any deeper right now on this, but well, at that moment, I developed my project. I think it was relevant, but I think that there was also some of the aspects that were not uh, fully developed. Most, I think that probably from the cultural perspective, on the from cultural strategy point of view, the work was relevant, but while I was developing these strategic interventions through systems that were already in place, you know, maybe um, those systems were being completely disrupted at the same time. I focused on the message, but I forgot about the medium probably. And I developed the symbolic, but probably I neglected the material, which took me to a next step on my investigation. Uh, during the production of this thesis, I ended up uh, reading the works of Benjamin Bratton. Well, I didn't read the whole whole thing because it's about 500 words, uh, really, really dense materials. But I, there is something that I really fall in love with from the very beginning, and it's the fact that even if it was dealing with extremely complex theory, and it was uh, agglutinating a lot of uh, ideas together, it was offering people, and particularly offering designers, a very, very clear description and construction and model of the world. A model that can allow them to look at what they already know from a different perspective. Ever since I tried to get that in every single project that I do. Uh, so basically, I will try to summarize this book in four sentences. Obviously, if you see this video, it's not going to be a good thing. 
uh, that the tradition, basically what it's coming to say is that the traditional division of land in horizontal parsets, plots, countries, uh, is an insufficient cartography for the actual geopolitical scenario. In the last decades, an extra layer of information has been overlaid on the traditional geographic earth. Uh, this layer, everyone thinks about it as something ethereal, something light, something that is floating above us. Actually, it's not. It relies on super heavy infrastructures. Uh, as users, we access those infrastructures through distributed interfaces. But in fact, the city uh, can be understood itself uh, as, a, as an area of highly density of interfacial, uh, of in high, high interfacial density, sorry. So I found this was kind of super relevant. It was a theory I got introduced to. Obviously a model, every model is false, but I consider good models are useful in a particular moment in time. So actually the book was a design brief for the generation of mob models. And the new normal was an urban design think tank that was generated immediately afterwards in Strelka Institute in Moscow. I apply, I got in, and basically the late motif of, the, of this uh, program was the future has not been canceled. That evolved into the terraforming and the, the late motif has also evolved. Now the future is not canceled, the future is to be prevented. But obviously it's talking about the consequences of the Anthropocene, how the Anthropocene has proven us that we can act in a global scale, even if we don't intend to. And basically it's promoting a discourse that if we want to gain back the territory that we have lost in face of climate change, we should use artificiality to get there. There is no going back to nature. There is no such thing as nature and artificiality as things that are different. Well, in any case, I don't want to, I don't want to enter in more theory about the new normal because then I could take one hour to talk about it and I would not have time to talk about anything else. But I can give you the example that is actually the best ever description that I have felt about what um, the Anthropocene actually is. In 2016, uh, the, the, the Super Bowl in the United States, uh, Beyoncé published a song that was called Formation. Uh, in one sentence in this song, Beyoncé suggested something that uh, when JC fucks her good, uh, she takes her his ass to uh, Red Lobster. The immediate next day, the sales of Red Lobster went up by, one, by 150%, something like that. So basically, Red Lobster is one of the biggest, uh, well, that is very good for numbers. Everyone said this was an accident. It was not intended. It's not a communication campaign. But when I see the colors in, this, in these pictures, I doubt that because she's really looking like in brown. Uh, in any case, everyone is getting the, the, the economic numbers. But the thing is that Red Lobster is one of the biggest uh, consumers of prawns in the world, in the States particularly. And Prawns are not produced by farming. Prawns are extracted from the uh, sea, how do you say, uh, El Fondo Marino? Seafood, okay, well, you understand. Uh, so basically, for one day, for some months, the, 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 the numbers stay up, and actually, we could understand that Beyonce, with her lyrics, was actually uh, directly, and it could be understood as a force of nature. So is this the relationship between media, between culture, between infrastructure, and between ecology that we are talking about and that I try to bring to every project? But OK, what do I did there? What is the work that I did? Um, SAGE is a project that was developed uh, in 2018. The first phase, there has been the uh, next phase. I will try to explain very, very simply briefly and then I will let you with the video that we produce so you can get a little bit of the feeling of the medium that we were using to produce those stories. So SAGE established an operational framework. This is important based on the understanding of legislation as software, bureaucracy as a data workflow in urban fabric as the sensing of infrastructure or the sensing hardware that is managing that software. It is speculated with the idea of border, with the idea of dynamic lawmaking and with more fluid conceptions of citizenship. It was actually stating that there is a surveillance infrastructure that is being set up in place. We are being continuously sensing by a, sensed by a system. We should somehow gain some rights, some citizen rights in exchange. 
and he was speculating with the idea of a more fluid um, conception of citizenship, probably between international borders in this stage. Uh, so it was in a very specific context, transnational flows, infrastructural switch points, which are in this project symbolically embodied in two things, Bell and Road Initiative and Corcus Dry Port. Bell and Road Initiative is the biggest infrastructural project globally today. It's also an investment plan with a three years view span promoted by the Chinese government to create a strong Eurasian trade zone. Corgos is a logistic enclave in the center of this uh, infrastructure, precisely in the very, very, very center of Eurasia, 5,000 kilometers away from any um, sea in the world. It's the biggest dry port in the world and the setting stone of Bell and Road Initiative. It also happens to be the point where the Chinese railway system and the old CIS railway system meet. They have different width, different widths. So it's the connection between two infrastructural systems, the connection between two political systems, and a very, very good symbolic element to showcase somehow what infrastructure space looks like and how certain futures that are being built are already alive in the present. I just leave you with the movie for a little moment. It's not a movie, it's some extractions. I hope you can see them. Citizenship and sovereignty, but traditionally rooted in territorial belonging. But as transnational flows of people, capital, goods, and information continue to expand, this conception is undermined. Current crises of citizenship can be explained as conflicts over the infrastructures that sustain these flows. Belt and Road Initiative, a Chinese-led long-term plan to generate a Eurasian trade zone around the old Silk Road, affects 65% of global population and is the most ambitious contemporary infrastructure project. Orgos Triport is a logistic enclave between two infrastructural and political realities. Automation of logistics in border condition relies heavily on cross-jurisdictional interactions, shared databases, and the implementation of sensing systems ruled by code. SAGE is a platform that enables independent organizations to design and manage technical procedures of information exchange, acting as an interface between legal and data workflows. Customs, borders, switches, checkpoints and controls are the touch points among systems. The management of exchanges among them is a complex task. An extra layer of difficulty appears when systems use different information protocols, track entities of a different category, or simply speak a different language. to function in a particular way. Every set of rules can be represented as an algorithm dealing with particular classes of objects. SAGE acts as an interface between legal and data workflows by translating laws into object notation network structures a machine-readable format. It allows the interested parts to visualize and modify those representations consequently generating an actualized version of the legal text in natural language. The code that will manage the sensing apparatus that process the exchange and adding them to a technolegal procedures repository. Once ontological derivative structures are defined, SAGE allows to map the history of procedures 
a particular entity has interacted with. To simulate the motility of any particular entity or association of entities through a particular procedure and ultimately to map the emergent network of procedural sovereignties the use in time and space of a particular set of exchange rules. The project was uh, obviously taking a very, very speculative approach, uh, but we were proposing a platform that uses a visual coding system to design law, and that actually on one side produces the legal text, and on the other side uh, produces the code of the sensing apparatus that is going to implement the laws. And we were just speculating about how this tool might help countries exchange information to, con to control uh, borders, to move bureaucracy to the back end so people can move without any real interaction. The thing is that the project takes a very, very speculative uh, output. It looks even this topic is intentional. Uh, but the technologies that are being implemented actually in Corgos today are exactly like that almost. Uh, so actually what we are explaining is much more about the present than about the future. We are probably local, delocalizing it. But anyway, I don't want to enter in more depth, depth now. Depth now. What I want to say is that obviously when we developed this project, it was developed in one month and a half. It's a visual representation. It's a complete speculation. We found a place to represent the idea. Corgos, we use the visual material and we conceptualize the system in a very, very basic manner. But that brings us the opportunity to be seen, to be uh, uh, seen by other people, generate some interest, and get certain uh, other publications more serious to publish a, an article with more content, no? But that really develops these systems, these uh, mindsets um, with more detail. In any case, um, when I enter in, it's just about the, the developing the idea that when you generate a speculative design project, you are also generating the possibility for the thing to grow, to grow further. Um, obviously, this project happened uh, two years ago. As the beginning, we even developed a last phase for Sanchez Biennale of uh, Architecture and Urban Design uh, by City Biennale. Yeah, it was an interactive installation. But the thing is that obviously the context has changed a lot now. And what is happening is that the border that used to be in these switch points is actually becoming ubiquitous. The tracking that actually used to happen in those switch points is becoming ubiquitous. So it's we are actually developing a further stage of the process in collaboration with Sweka Institute and Hong Kong Design Trust to not only study this concept in the transnational border condition, but to actually in a much more domestic environment as the current situation uh, might suggest. Uh, obviously, I didn't expect, the, the interesting thing is that when you decide to develop a project like this, you don't really know what you are doing at the very beginning. You are start, starting to establish some ideas. That is fine because the first goal of the project was not to create the platform in itself, but to make think people reflect about the fact that this kind of platform is actually being put in place by much bigger actors and to create the vocabulary and the mindset for those people to understand this world. In any case, next. This was complex and you must be thinking, this guy is crazy working on this kind of thing so complex and, and, and I was working on it for a long time and I was also thinking the same. So this work, lives in a particular environment, no? it lives in an academic uh, journal, art circuit and architecture biennale. And, and after working on this kind of abstract modeling of the world for such a long time, I, I had this feeling of, okay, speculation is okay, the future is okay, new mindsets are required, but, and you take all these mindsets and abstractions and turn them into a tangible project for the many people and taking to the, the many people as a branded sentence from Space Ten, which is the institution that supported our next project. Uh, and that actually teach me how to develop a much more democratic, inclusive uh, language uh, on my speculative design work. Uh, BFL is a project that stands at the intersection of technology and cultural strategy, and it deals with critical global issues such as plastic waste, soil scarcity, and deforestation due to agricultural development. The project started as a material research based on mycelium. On mycelium. mycelium is the root for mushrooms, and if you feed it the right natural substrates, it develops it develop structural properties, it solidifies uh, when, when it dries. So we were trying to find a way of um, shaping it, but without using molds. And we started working with the idea of molding flat sheets into three-dimensional objects. At some point, we found back in bugging that was an already existing technique that we didn't really know. And back in bugging basically allows you to mix your binder, sorry, put it inside your backing bag, 
Ready? Back me. Close and shape. But we thought, okay, we might eventually someday be able to um, produce our own biodegradable furniture. But in the meantime, with this, we are using an extremely crazy amount of plastic. If we want this technique to be actually sustainable, we should make, we are not, we were not material scientists. So we were designers. So we should maybe not focus so much on the material that we are using, but on the medium itself. And if we want to use plastic bags to do this, it should be a reusable, recyclable plastic bag. Uh, it happened that we were working for Space 10 at the moment. Space 10, that if you don't know, is an innovation lab that is funded by IKEA. It happens to have the most popular, iconic, uh, reusable, recycled plastic bag in the world. Not only that, two years ago, there was a big trend uh, of uh, hacking it into other stuff like masks, like clothes, like backpacks. And there was this huge polemic with Balenciaga tried to develop this super luxury 2,500 euros um, back. And then we decided, okay, can we take all this cultural value of a product that everyone can relate to to reintroduce a technology in the market as vacuum bagging? Could we use, could we hack Fracta into a reusable vacuum bagging system? And that's what we did. We tried to make it on the opposite to any other project like um, the ones I showed you before. Very, very, very naive, playful. And obviously uh, the project was not uh, totally accomplished yet because uh, quarantine uh, just hit us in the middle of all the material research and stuff. But even though we decided we should develop and put it out there and start generating the conversation because the generation of the conversation is what actually might eventually make the project leap up front. So could we not only use Fracta uh, to, to create this bag, but to suggest the idea that we could generate a completely different alternative furniture supply chain in a more tangible way. So basically we took the dimensions, we took the dimensions of the bag and started designing a platform for the design of three-dimensional morphologies and a small family of morphologies that could easily live in your living room. Um, the idea was to suggest that eventually, in a not so distant future, you could be able to produce your furniture with one simple backing, reusable backing bag, and some agricultural fund, uh, fibers and binders that you could find as you find milk in a, super, milk in a supermarket. It was a really, really uh, playful, uh, and we felt that in the place where we were, it was necessary to, to just do it and put it out there. It was like, could, people have been hacking Fracta, but could we hack Fracta to do what IKEA already does in the first place, to produce furniture and to actually do it in a playful, cheap and sustainable way. Well, as you see, uh, speculation is present in many different ways in many different of my projects. Some of them are dealing with very serious topics. Some of them are more playful. And at some point for me, it's about balancing uh, where the material stands, where reality stands, what is a speculation and how one can benefit from the other. For me, the fact of producing narrative, speculative narratives is also a way to secure life for projects that can grow farther. Um, just wanted to say that, uh, I don't know if I have managed to find the right balance there, probably not. I'm sure that Beyoncé did much better than I did, but for the moment I'm trying to put a methodology or a way of making in place that I would like to show you to discuss and see your thoughts. So I'm trying to advocate for nuanced research, for tales speculation, generative models, and platform strategy. What is that? Nuanced research. Research that is projects that are research driven and formal agnostic, that map ecologies, cultures, and infrastructures to define how they interface with each other. I'm trying to always look at those elements separately. Normally, when I start a project, I'm looking for a new discipline where I am not necessarily an expert. I'm working with other people that are experts. And I'm trying to see this kind of playful interactions between culture, between ecology, and between the systems that are already in place. First, I try to define a descriptive model that allows me to understand what is already in place. It's then that I start speculating. And I speculate in two ways. On one side, with material devices that for me, they bring possibilities. And on the other side, with symbolic devices that for me, they help to establish relationships, to establish logics, to establish hierarchies to understand what is more likely, what is almost unavoidable, what is 
a perfect match. It's only when I find those two ingredients that I feel more confident to go towards a projective model of what might happen, what could happen. So just to say that I try to play with the interplay of the material and the symbolic, but I also try to play with the speculation towards the past and towards the future to deal with the contingencies of the present. Uh, ultimately, we dispute the territory of systems thinking by providing logics, structural frameworks that challenge preconceived meanings, patterns, and relationships. If I don't find the way in a project to make people look different to something that they already know, probably I don't feel that I'm doing what I have to do. And ultimately, one that you have like this descriptive model, this understanding of what it is in this projective model, not only of what it could be, but what would be the mindset that could be in that possible future is when I start thinking about a strategy and in a way more related to medium strategy, not only doing the thing, but generating the circumstances for the thing to happen and looking at digital and physical interfaces at the same level, just as mediums for the delivery of strategy. And well, if anyone wants to look at any other of my projects, uh, you can go whenever you want. Uh, I just basically wanted to show a little bit around and, think, and just say that if anyone has shared agenda or that they have shared interest or think that there is something interesting that they would like to discuss about, this uh, hello raft house contact me thank you very much hey thank you very much thomas i think uh, it was very very insightful well uh, i work also for construction sector and i'm an industrial designer so all the 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 uh, projects that you you show us it, it was really really interesting i think we have uh, some questions through the chat steph yeah. if you can unmute and <laughs> yes <laughs> okay. i have to say i write down this question while i was listening to you and i, I to be honest my, my mind was like exploding so let's see if, it, if that that makes sense so i'd like to say that as you said, do you think we can have any kind of agency success or impacts if we are not aware of those, those kind of hard facts that, ha that are happening in our world because they are invisible, bigger than us, or just unthinkable, or because they, the origin then doesn't want to make, a, make that uh, visible in one way? Uh, I'm not establish I'm trying at all to establish a dogma. I, I just... I just explain like a methodology or a way of making that works for me. And it's about combining those two things. It's also very related to my background. And that is the reason why I, I explain that way. I've worked with other people in some projects that are completely 100% speculative and they are also valid and they have maybe other purpose and they can generate a conversation as well. So I wouldn't say this is the only way, of course, you can get a very, very relevant project that is purely speculative and you can make it much better precisely because you are getting rid of a huge weight, no? So it's not like there is a dogma, you can completely do both. But I mean, these this huge things that are in one way hidden in the planet, I mean, in the middle of something in these strange lands uh, that are happening without being aware that are happening at all. So we, are, we have our regular work uh, thinking that we are, uh, we are uh, how, do you, how do you say, uh, building something really that has impact and at the same time, we are not aware that some at, at the other in the other way around of the planet, there's something really huge happening that could um, be interrelated with our work, and we are not aware of it. Does it make sense? Did I explain myself? Yeah, I mean, um... I mean, these huge ports, these huge infrastructures, the geopolitics of that places, we are not aware because we are not aware. Yeah. Yeah. I was not aware either. Uh, like, uh, you know, it's impact is also very relative. You're acting on your particular bubble. I'm acting in my particular bubble. Estrelka was also a bubble, one of the more radical bubbles that I have ever been in. And it's not that, uh, how's the truth? I could not tell you, oh, now I understand a complete different level. I also see that, the, you know, everything is very relative. So, I was exposed to this kind of research, to understanding of certain systems, to 
a discourse that gave me an understanding of what was going on on part of the parts of the world that I have not been exposed to before. Obviously, I, I, I feel somehow privileged to get to know that, but I cannot live in that space 100% of the time. So influence is also very relative and relevance is also very relative. You can be relevant for your city, you can be relevant for your country, you can be relevant for a particular discipline, you can be relevant for, I mean, you, as I told you, you cannot always tackle the big problems and precisely with the last, with the last project that we did for Spiston, we were trying to escape that large scale, huge infrastructures to go to the very, very small, uh, domestic, funny, playful, and maybe it's more effective. So there's no one way, but it's all, all I can say. Uh, there is no one way, but it's always better to be conscious of why you are acting, the way you are acting, where you are acting, at what scale, define the scope of your intervention. And it's just that, be conscious of defining the scope of where you are acting. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, totally agree with you. And I have another question. It's not a question, but um, surprised me a lot when you, uh, you said that you changed the language you used between the first projects and then when you moved to Space, space 10, that perhaps you were uh, more conscious about the language to use a more simple or playful one. Is it, do you think language in this case, in speculative thinking is, uh, yeah, it's an important issue to take care of. Yeah, if you look at um, the brief of the new normal, they talk about models, but uh, language is actually one of the key deliverables of the whole initiative. If you look at the book of Bratton, for example, that I show you, it's 500 works, but the last chapter is glossary, and it's only new terms, and it's my favorite chapter, because if it gives you one, two words that are catchy, that you can identify, that you can see where they are coming, that they are playing with something that they can relate to, and they are explaining you something much more complex. Uh, that is the best thing that I, that I think he does, creating words that are catchy, that are understandable, and that synthesize something that is very complex into something understandable for someone that is not a philosopher, that is not a uh, sociologist, that is not, I am not, I am a designer, I'm coming, I, I, I'm a, you know, I'm trying to be exposed to this kind of complex discourse and synthesize something simple that I can use. For me, models are something that I can use in one particular moment in time for a particular context to do something. And they are good today. They don't have to be good tomorrow. They are not models forever. But um, I think I just lost track of the question you were asking. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, uh, Vocabulary is, with no doubt, uh, key. I have a question. Just one thing, uh, Thomas. Can you stop uh, the shared screen, please? Just yes. to so all the faces in the in the same place. No. Okay, just one second. I am just not used to this. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, Thomas. I really enjoyed it. Um, as you said, at the beginning was kind of complex for me to enter uh, in your world um, because I just uh, went out from an, a meeting. So my brain was like, Ugh! but at the end you, like you explain and you make sense of everything. So thank you. I have a question. Um, do you have any recommendation for us to be more aware of the unknowns, unknowns that are in the world? Any recommendation? Mm. What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> I don't do that much. I've been, uh, I guess I've been in, I got good friends that are more intelligent than I. And I try to surround myself by people that are much smarter than I am. That's what I always try to do. I try to synthesize that complexity into something that I can translate to other people as well. Um, I would say that uh, 
as you saw in my work, there is always like uh, every project was sending with a question. And every project was sending with like, okay, there is something that I accomplished, but there's still something that I haven't got to, that I didn't get yet, that I could not understand. Well, how, what can I do to understand it? And for me, I was uh, very driven in the way that if I was very interested or passionate about something or just considered that something was worth my interest, I could, I could just not, not do it. As the same way that if I see this clash of ideas in a project, there is an almost, okay, I can just not do it. I have to do it. Uh, and that is what I'm trying to search for. Obviously, it's not like, um, yeah, uh, beware of your networks. It's really easy to get locked in your own Facebook feed. That's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. Try I love that answer. <laughs> try to uh, reveal against your automated news feed. Like basically, the whole point of is like uh, artificial intelligence can machine sensing data collection can be used for much, 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 much smarter things that, that to produce targeted targeted uh, marketing, to produce recommendation lists, can actually serve to reorganize life in space otherwise. Uh, so that was the whole point. Thank you. Yeah. The algorithm. I mean, the algorithm is not smarter than you. It's just. Well, Ana Sara Sola has uh, another question. You can unmute Ana if you want. Uh, see, yeah. Hi. So I want to ask you how expert do you think we need to be about a subject or about a certain field before speculating about it? That's a good question. Uh, I could say the best thing you can do is not working alone. Like a uh, project we did in Space 10, Katia was an expert in parametric design. The project we did in Stryka Institute, there was a lawyer, there was a developer, there was a journalist, there was, in this case, me, there was an artist. Um, even though, still, there was a lot of handicaps. I also had this feeling many, many times, like how am I going to explain this project to someone that is an actual developer that is doing these systems for real? And what is the purpose of all of this? And I think it's that, that role of translator, actually. And you are making something that is not relevant into something that can be somehow digested by others. I don't know if those others is common people or those others is a particular circuit in academia. It obviously depends on the project, but you have to know who you are getting your information from and who you are sending your information to. Obviously, I am very conscious that in many, many environments, um, I would say it this way, for example, with the, with the project that we did for Space 10, we had a very, very harsh critic on Instagram. Uh, it was a design technologist that was also a teacher in Barlett uh, Architecture School. So it was basically the, this is not real parametric design. This is like super basic. This is uh, in architecture school, we will completely destroy it. Uh, the fact is that the project was not for people that works in Barlet or in an architecture school. It's not even for architecture students. It's for people that do not really know what parametric design is. And it's for people that do not really know what a biocomposite is or how a future, a future material culture could be. Space 10 is very, very um, conscious about generating projects that are not only, um, you know, one, one thing is the project, one thing is what you say about the project. One thing is the project and the research that you are doing behind. That project has much, much, much more depth than what we eventually have shown, actually. But we decided to, for the moment, go very, very low key and very, very, very basic, precisely to just generate the conversation, see how it works. The trust, further development might come afterwards. So it's about, yeah, there is the project, there is what you say about the project, and there is who is giving you the information and who you are targeting your work to. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? No, I don't think so. So if you want, we are going to stay like five, 10 minutes and you can uh, take a beer or water or whatever you want to, 
to extend a little bit uh, the, the conversation. Uh, well, Thomas, thank you very much for yes. joining us today. And um, thank you all for, for connect to the, to the event.